somehow I don't see the window to share. Why is that? Ah, there we go. Found it. In full screen. So thank you for the invitation. And Human actually asked me to talk about dark matter, but I ended up talking about Axion, so I apologize. So uh, I, I'm not following your guideline. So I'd like to talk about the few, two papers that I've written recently about Axion. And one of them is about cosmic axion background. That's the subject I'm going to talk about first. And for the second half of my talk, I'd like to talk about this idea that the axion string is actually superconducting and what come, uh, may be the phenomenological consequences. So the idea for axion has been around for a while. And the Korea is one of the very active places in, in the research in axion physics. So it started with this old puzzle, why doesn't strong interaction violate CP? Namely that you can add this term to the Lagrangian but that there's a very strong limit on this variable, the theta angle. And this is called theta angle because this parameter is actually periodic in two pi. So you may expect that you know, if it can be as large as two pi, then the number should be order one. But if this term is present, that will lead to this electric dipole moment of the neutron. And if you work it out, the electron dipole moment of the neutron is predicted as a function of this vacuum angle theta to be uh, in this uh, combination. And we know there's a very strong experimental limit on the possible size of the electric dipole moment of the neutron. So that's how we conclude that this theta parameter has to be less than 10 to minus 10 or so. And just to understand how incredible this experimental limit is, the electric dipole moment, as we study in classical electromagnetism, is a separation of a positive and negative charges. So if you actually translate this experimental limit, by blowing up the size of the neutron to our planet, you're talking about the separation of the charges only by a two micron or so, or not, it doesn't show up somehow well, for some reason. So it's a tiny, tiny electric dipole moment. And that's why the limit is so strong at the level of 10 to minus 10 or so. So to understand why this parameter is so small without doing any fine tuning to the theory, the idea came up by Peche and Quinn to promote this parameter to a dynamical field. So it's no longer just a parameter in the theory, but it can now move. And if you actually go ahead and translate this QC Lagrangian to the Cairo Lagrangian, where this parameter theta together with this axion field appears in this phase of the mass matrix of the quarks, then if you integrate all the mesons out of this theory, then you find the potential energy for this axion field so that it settles where the theta parameter is, is exactly canceled. So that's how you can solve the strong CP problem and became a very popular idea in this context. And the name Axion was uh, uh, what the, Frank Richard came up with when he was thinking about this theory and visited a supermarket in France where they are selling this detergent named Axion. So this Axion was motivated by the strong CP problem, but now we are talking about Axion in much more general grounds. For example, in string theory, there, there's a dilaton field and many moduli fields depending on what kind of compactification you have in mind. The imaginary part of dilaton and moduli have very similar coupling to the QCD axion. Namely, it couples to the combination of FF dual, GG dual of various gauge fields. An axion can be dark matter. And, but one can consider more general axion-like particles, which have these couplings to FF dual and GG dual, may not necessarily relevant to solve the strong CP problem, but it could be uh, there for uh, uh, various reasons, and we can consider phenomenology of that. So much of my talk is along the spirit uh, of thinking about axion-like particles. So the first half of the talk is about this idea of thinking about the cosmic axion background, namely they are relativistic axions that exist in the universe today and see if we, we can come up with a way of constraining and detecting them in the future. So people often talk about axion as a candidate for dark matter. And to be a candidate for dark matter, of course, it has to be non-relativistic. Yeah. But there could also be relativistic axions today. Was anybody speaking? Sorry, I heard some voice. Is that a question? Maybe not. No. Okay. Well, please interrupt me anytime if you have any questions. So there could be relativistic axions today, which might be produced by various different mechanisms. The one of them is the thermal axions. When axions are in thermal equilibrium, 
with the rest of the thermal map, then they, they of course have a, a black body radiation spectrum. And axion being a very light particle, it may still remain in this black body spectrum. And that's the idea of thermal axions. It is also possible that we have some dark matter particle and dark matter particle might decay into axions today in the galactic halo. And so for example, if you have a scalar field, which corresponds to the radial direction of the axial potential, sometimes called saxion, it may decay into two axions. Or you may have some heavy neutrino that decays to light neutrino and axion. You can think of all kinds of possible scenarios like that. Then the final state axion could well be relativistic. The axions might also come from a decay of topological defects, most famously axion string, but could also come from domain walls and so on. So there could be these additional sources of relativistic axions. So at least it's worthwhile thinking about that. And as I said already, thermal axion is just plain black body radiation. And how much of that exists today depends on when axion decouples from the rest of the thermal bath made of the standard model particles. And for the QCD axion, there is a very strong limit on how strongly axion can couple to the standard model particles. For example, the constraint from supernova 1987A or constraint from uh, uh, white dwarf cooling. So typically the axion de uh, the decoupling temperature is actually well above TeV scale. And the earlier the decoupling is, you end up with a fewer number of axions because the rest of the universe gets reheated by decoupling extra degrees of freedom all the way down to in the end, basically just the photons and neutrinos. So in this kind of the decoupling temperature, which gives you basically the same spectrum as the TeV case, you extract a few number of them. But here I'm talking about axion light particles, so they may not be necessarily subject to the same constraints. So here I'm regarding this decoupling temperature to be a free parameter. And if the decoupling temperature is, for example, today, or it may not have decoupled at all, then of course you would predict the same spectrum as the CMB spectrum uh, in the black body radiation. If decoupling temperature is MeV or something, then, then it's somewhere in between those limits. And this is actually already interesting that some people have already pointed this out, that there is now what is called the H naught puzzle. So the near uh, uh, universe measurement of the Hubble constant prefers rather high Hubble constant, while CMB based measurements prefer low Hubble constant. They are, they don't agree at the level of something like two to three sigma, depending on how you look at it. And one way to reconcile them to have additional relativistic degrees of free freedom in the universe today, in addition to CMB photons and neutrinos. And, and that is the range given by this uh, purple band. So if you have axion like relativistic particles, which were in thermal equilibrium, but decoupled at the MEV kind of temperature, that is actually interesting from this point of view. And I show many plots on this uh, pl plane the horizontal axis, the frequency, angular frequency of the axion. The reason I'm plotting is for angular frequency instead of energy is that when we actually think about trying to uh, capture these axions, what matters is the frequency and wavelength of the apparatus. That's why the frequency is a convenient unit for this purpose. And the vertical axis is the differential axion abundance namely that this is omega axion as a function of the uh, frequency, which is defined by the axion density over the critical density of the universe today, but is, is a logarithmic derivative with respect to the, uh, 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 the angular frequency. So if you are in this log log plot, if you integrate linearly on the log axis and that recovers the total axion uh, omega, but this is shown in a differential way so that you can see the dependence on the angular frequency. So that's the idea of the thermal axion. So the other case I mentioned is that the dark matter may be decaying to axion today. So consider a dark matter, which is a scalar particle, which is pretty light. And so it's oscillating in a galactic halo today in, in a coherent fashion, but it might decay into two axions as an example. And if this decay happens to go like the Kato, the chi decays into two axions. Each axion carries the energy of the mass of chi over two, so half of the mass. 
So that would give you a monochromatic peak in the axion spectrum. But if this happens in the history of the universe throughout from other galaxies, they may still be just after redshifting, and therefore that gives us a tail of the axion to a lower frequency because of the redshifts. So you, ex you expect these two components, you have this monochromatic peak, and then you have this long tail uh, coming from the uh, con uh, continuum tail coming from the axion in, from extra galactic sources. But even though I said this, this peak is monochromatic, it's not exactly monochromatic because when chi decays, chi in the galactic halo has a little bit of velocity at the level of 10 to minus three or so. As a result, the axion can also be Doppler shifted either to red or blue by this motion of the, uh, the, the dark matter particle that is decaying. So the axion energy uh, gets Doppler shifted by an amount actually linear in the velocity of chi. So the velocity of chi is at the level 10 to minus three times speed of light. So this is actually not that narrow uh, compared to dark matter axion, which has the velocity also 10 to minus three, but the kinetic energy is spread out only by half mv squared. That's the kinetic energy of the non-relativistic particle. So the spread is only at the level 10 to minus six instead of 10 to minus three. And that is actually one of the uh, 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 important points when you think about detecting it, because the typical dark matter detection experiments on axion is really focused on this very narrow spread at the level of 10 to minus six. So 10 to minus three is actually rather broad distribution in frequency. So we'll come back and talk about that later. But anyway, so this is one possible source of the relativist axions today. And also the axion, or in general, some Goldstone bosons might come also with a network of strings if it's based on, for example, the uh, uh, U1 symmetry group. And the fact that the string network forms and then evolves in a scale invariant fashion has been known for a long time. And there, there's a much more uh, uh, serious uh, effort to do the string simulation these days. So we actually relied on these people. And then by translating what they have done for the QCD string, to a generic axion situation, which you are interested in, then that it actually depends on the, uh, the decay constant of the axion, which corresponds to the scale of symmetry breaking. And here I'm showing three curves, depending on what the symmetry breaking scale may be. And if the symmetry breaking scale, scale is high, that tends to give you again, a relatively large amount of the relativistic axions. And the high frequency at when end of the spectrum actually does depend on this decoupling temperature because after the axions are produced from the strings, they may thermalize again, and that gets basically absorbed in the thermal bath. Then you have this depression going to this dashed line. So the projection of the spectrum of axions coming from the string does depend on this decoupling temperature. But overall, it's predominantly determined by the overall axion decay constant. And making in this plot, I'm assuming that there's no primordial magnetic field, which becomes actually relevant for the second half of my problem. But anyway, that's what I'm assuming here for the sake of discussion. So the important question we wanted to ask is whether we can detect this uh, relativistic axion in the universe today. So the only coupling I assume is the coupling to electromagnetic field. And in the case of the dark matter axion, I mentioned this already, we expect a very narrow spread in the frequencies or energy of the axion because the energy spread goes like the square of the velocity. And so that's why axion experiments focus on a very narrow frequency range and do the scan. But the relativistic axion, as I mentioned already, is much more spread out in frequencies so that requires a different way of analyzing the data or even a different strategy of scanning. And interactions also need to be worked out without assuming non relativistic limit, where all the experiments so far do make an assumption of non relativistic axion. So we have to think about how that changes for the relativistic case. So this is, for example, the time variation of the axion field, and then it's very different from this very coherent behavior of the dark matter axion, which is basically a pendulum, uh, it's a quadratic uh, potential. And the reason why you have this behavior is because the axion is basically a Bose-Einstein condensate of cold 
axioms, and that's why it becomes a, co a coherent scalar field. But in the, in the case of relativistic axion, like coming from cosmic string, you have this very, very jagged behavior. And in the case of uh, Gaussian distribution, you have somewhat more uh, the regular behavior, but nonetheless, it doesn't look uh, coherent at all. So that's actually a major change that some of the experimental techniques would not work for uh, relativistic axions, and you'll see an example of that soon. So the way you study how either non-relativistic or relativistic axions would interact with the electromagnetic field is, is, is understood just by writing down the Maxwell equation together with its coupling of axion to E dot B, and then you get these additional terms on the right-hand side of the Maxwell equations, and you also have the source of the axion coming from E dot B. And so the way you can read off the, uh, the axion interaction to the electromagnetic field is that basically the spatial variation of the axion field would act as a uh, 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 as a charge density. And also the time variation as well as spatial variation of the axion field would work as an electromagnetic current. So this is the way axion field would affect electromagnetism then you uh, study its consequences so that you can uh, think about some detection methods of the axion by using electromagnetism. And what happens in the case of non-relativistic axion, like in the case of dark matter I mentioned, you can ignore the spatial variation because they are slow. Slow means low momentum, and momentum is a spatial derivative. That's why you can ignore them. So the main coupling only comes from this time variation of the axion field. And in the case of dark matter, that is this very regular oscillation, as you saw on the previous slide. So that's the only source you would think about. But when the axion is relativistic, that's not the only thing. You really have to consider also the spatial variation of the axion field, which is of the same order of magnitude as the time variation, because you know time variation is energy, spatial variation of the momentum, and E is basically C times B, so that's an order one effect. So that actually does affect the detection methods. We do have uh, the various constraints, mostly from astrophysics on axion parameter space. So typically we are thinking about this axion decay constant to be rather high, beyond 10 to the HGEV or so, and for very high masses, uh, axial decay constant, then you have this uh, non, uh, the misalignment mechanism of producing that axion as a dark matter. So that's another area of interest. But anyway, the reason I'm showing this plot is that I, we are typically interested in very high energy scale for the axion decay constant. So one of the prime examples of axion detection, like ADMX, is the idea of using this coupling and you have placed a very strong magnetic field here, and the axion comes into this superconducting cavity, and, and then the axion can convert into photon, and you resonantly capture this photon in this cavity, and then you basically uh, change the, uh, the, 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 the resonant frequency over time to scan the parameter space. So this is a situation I mentioned earlier that you have sensitivity to a very narrow range of the, the frequency of the photon, which corresponds to the mass of the axion. And of course, the people in Korea is also are very active in this area at IBS in, in, in Daejeon. And so uh, this is a uh, worldwide effort with a lot of competition. And this technique could work for the relativistic axion as well. The only difference is that you have to resonantly capture the photon where frequency of the photon would correspond to the energy or momentum of the axion, not the mass of the axion. So uh, based on that, basically the simple change in how to read off the, not the mass of the axion, but rather the frequency of the axion, this experiment could work for the relativistic axion as well. And this is another experiment. I'm showing this because I'm from Berkeley. This is the experiment led by Berkeley group called Haystack uh, using basically the same idea. And the Korean group is, is also looking into a similar parameter space as well. So it's a serious competition going on right now. One relatively recent idea, which is a brilliant idea by uh, Dima Butka, another of my collaborator in Berkeley, uh, with the Sergei Zendran, Peter Graham, and so on, is to take this axion field of this uh, time oscillating uh, 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 configuration to put that into the prediction on the electric dipole moment. 
So basically, you have an oscillating electric dipole moment as a result of this uh, theta I mean, changing as a function of time. And so there's a way of actually picking up the signal by using, for example, the magnetic resonance. But in this case, it really relies on this coherent time oscillation of the axion field. So this one actually doesn't apply for the relativistic axion because it doesn't give you coherent axion field. So this is actually an experiment that does not work for the relativistic axions. So you really have to look at one by one. Another way of looking for axion, uh, uh, this is a slide I actually borrowed from people working on Abracadabra experiment at MIT, so in this case from Jonathan Ouellet. So because the axion field time derivative would work as the uh, electromagnetic current I mentioned earlier, if you have the magnetic field together with this time dependent axion field, you have the electromagnetic current in the direction of the magnetic field. So you have a current along the direction of magnetic field that ends up creating this helical magnetic or toroidal magnetic field around it. So constant magnetic field ends up creating a time dependent toroidal magnetic field. So the experiment called abracadabra is actually meant to literally detect that. If you have this toroidal magnet here, so you have magnetic field going this way, that ends up producing magnetic field uh, circling around this toroid. And so that would give you a time dependent magnetic field in this uh, uh, the vertical direction punching through this hole. And that is something you can read out, for example, with a squid. So in this case, even when axion field is not macroscopically coherent, as long as it's time dependent, you still get the signal. So this experiment could work for the relativistic axion as well. So then you can start looking at, uh, at the sensitivities. So already, when you look at this uh, scalar field decaying to, to axions uh, with this kind of uh, uh, a coupling, then you may be, you, you already have a limit coming from the uh, ADMX experiment on the space of the lifetime of this dark matter decay. And if life, lifetime is longer, the decay is rare, so you don't exclude it. So obviously, the, uh, uh, the limit uh, uh, exists only for relatively short lifetime up to about 1,000 times the age of the universe today. But future experiment can actually improve this limit further. So in this case, I overlaid ADMX haystack and a future ambitious experiment called DM radio. So at least it's possible that we might detect relativistic axion this way. And one of the fun thing about it is that the detection rate actually depends on the incident angle to the direction of the magnetic field for obvious reasons. So this actually can give you a daily modulation of the signal if we actually do find the, uh, the signal of this relativistic axion, because dark matter is definitely concentrated towards the galactic center. So most of the axions come from the direction of the galactic center, but our Earth rotates once a day. So the relative angle, incident angle coming from the galactic center changes over a day period. So you, you expect demodulation of the signal in axion. So that is actually a rather unique signal, which would really smoking gun of the dark matter decay into axions. In the case of string, again, we relied on this uh, simulation of the strings and numerical simulation by uh, experts in the field by using the, uh, the result of this simulation on axion abundance in the frequency spectrum. We can translate that into the sensitivity from, for example, in this case, abracadabra experiment, which in, in the future aims to scale up to the level of 100 cubic meter. Then you do have this sensitivity getting down to even less than 10 to 15 GeV uh, decay constant. And we don't expect the coupling temperature to be higher than the K constant. So this gray region is theoretically uh, inaccessible. And so H not preferred region actually does come into a, a sensitivity range. So if this word explanation to the Hubble uh, 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 puzzle, then they, this may be actually a way of verifying that. So this is sort of a collection of all kinds of experiments we thought about. So this is the H not preferred range on, in this purple band. Again, the horizontal axis, the, the free, angular frequency of the axion. And so this dotted line is sort of the, 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 the barrier between the classical regime for the axion field to the quantum regime of, of axion particle. And here are various experiments already mentioned. And in the case of the dark matter decay, I did mention already that you could already cut into the sensitivity region for a particular mass of the particle chi in this case. 
And so that's this limit. And depending on the mass of the pi, of course, the angular frequency or energy of the axion changes. So sometimes you may get into these experiments, sometimes you may get into the inner radio. And this is the cosmic string, which does get into this uh, DM radio sensitivity, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And, and as I said, the main interest here is that if the axion, relativistic axion, is a really the explanation to this uh, puzzle in the H0 measurement, we do, do, do have a chance of detecting that. So here's a summary of this part. The, the cosmic axion background detection is definitely not easy. Uh, you know, we have never detected cosmic neutral background either. But nonetheless, it does look possible for at least two scenarios, namely dark matter decay and the axion string. And it does require a different analysis strategy. So if you're actually scanning the frequency uh, of the cavity uh, in terms of looking for a particular axion mass, the signal of the relativistic axion is spread out over a many range of the uh, frequencies. So you have to combine data from different scans and, 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 and do the data analysis together for the entire scan, not from a single scan. Uh, so that's a different analysis strategy. And if you're looking for potential daily modulation, you might also want to think about different scan strategy that you may want to actually sort of go back and forth in frequencies to run the experiment rather than just going one by one in a, in a linear sequence. So it may require different uh, uh, the scanning strategy. It definitely does require different analysis strategy. But if you actually do these things, you have a chance of detecting this with this axion. So that's the, the conclusion of the first half of my talk. Now I looks like I already have uh, 10 minutes left, so I have to go through the second part rather quickly. And that is about this idea that axion string is actually superconducting. You have so a as I mentioned already at the beginning, oh, 15, 15 minutes. Oh, okay. 15 minutes Good, because we started a uh, late, little bit late. Ah, well, thank you, Hyunmin. So as, as we talked about already, axion is a number goes to boson of a spontaneous broken U1 petri queen symmetry. So whenever you actually break U1 symmetry spontaneously, that will lead to a network of cosmic string by the gibbo zurek mechanism. But U1 petri queen in QCD axion is meant to be anomalous. That is the reason why it couples to GG dual. So ultimately, this U1 petri queen symmetry is not exact and therefore that will make the strings unstable. So if you have this, uh, 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 on the other hand, if there is a, a ZN subgroup of the one petri queen being non-anomalous, which happens when some of the quark fields in the theory come in multi multiples and non-trivial quantum numbers, then you have this exact ZN subgroup of the one petri queen being exact. And if the exact discrete symmetry spontaneously breaks, it also gives you domain walls in addition to string. And domain walls actually leads to a, a disaster uh, because it ends dominating the energy of the density of the universe later. So when you think about the axion string, therefore, in the context of QCD axion, this is actually not possible for the class of theories called DFSZ axion. It has to be so-called hadronic axion or KSVZ axion. And uh, uh, in this case, VZ axion also has to be of the minimal type, namely that you are allowed to have only one triplet, color triplet fermions as the Petri queen fermions, so that when you integrate out this triplet fermion, you produce this coupling to GG dual. So that is the theory we are going to focus on now because we are interested in the axion string for the QCD axion, and we'd like to understand its consequence of this. And it's well known that once string network is formed, it actually uh, undergoes this skate skating behavior because when the string forms, it looks kind of random. And that's the idea of the kibo zurek mechanism, namely that different parts of the universe use this different orientation of the vacuum along this bottom of this wine bottle potential. And therefore there is likely to be some mismatch of the axion field where the strings get formed. And, and this is the stochastic, stochastic process. But as the universe expands, the horizon size grows, and, and then the axiom wants, the string wants to simplify itself because the energy of the string is proportional to its length. So by stretching out the string, you can minimize the energy so the string network, network tries to simplify itself. But as the universe expands, the, uh, the, act, the string from the other horizon now comes into your horizon, and there's no reason to expect that they are perfectly aligned. So that you 
keep getting new configuration strings coming into your horizon and the network keeps simplifying itself. So that's how we ends up being sort of this self-similar behavior, which is called the scaling behavior. So you expect to see the consequence of the string over many, many decades of the expansion of the universe due to the scaling behavior. And that's why this kind of signal uh, is actually quite interesting, spanning over many orders of magnitude and frequencies, as we already discussed in the context of the first half of my talk today. And when the string networks try to simplify itself, that happens due to this reconnection, or creating a loop and cusps, and, and the reconnection and forming cusp is a relatively violent, uh, wild phenomenon, and that's when you create the burst of axions coming from this string. And around the string, the axion field pi would change its phase by two pi. So in terms of the axion field itself, that is the phase of this complex field, it changes as the a function of this uh, azimuthal angle around this string uh, and going from zero to two pi fa along this string, uh, which so there's a bit of discontinuity in the axion field on, on one side of the, uh, 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 the string. And of course, this continuity is unphysical because what is physical is this complex field instead of the phase itself. So that's how the string forms uh, as a function of the axion field. And so the uh, Yanui Kui uh, actually computed not only the axion production, this is the omega Goldstone stone boson as a function of decay constant, but she also looked into this uh, uh, other subdominant contribution to the gravitational wave background. So when the decay constant is relatively high, you might also see the gravitational wave background uh, coming from this axion string. So that's another interesting consequence of this axion string. But anyway, so coming back to the axion emission, so I said that the KSVZ axion is the only way to get a, a consistent string. And so that's why we're looking for the, uh, the simple, uh, the, uh, the one triplet uh, peche quinctromion, which I called Q here. So there's just one triplet fermion and nothing else. And once this phi acquires an expectation value, giving you the uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of U1 peche queen symmetry, then this Q field becomes massive whose mass is given by Yukawa coupling times the expectation value. And when you integrate out this massive Q, that's when you generate these couplings of the axion field. So GG dual for the QCD, FF dual for electromagnetism, for instance. And interesting thing here, which had not been discussed so much in the literature, is that when you have a coupling to electromagnetic field, that gives you this additional contribution to electromagnetic current and that's what we already used in a case of the discussion with this experimental techniques in trying to uh, identify the uh, detection techniques. Here I'm writing it in more the way deviscic notation. So the induced current from axion field is proportional to F, F, F dual times the derivative of the axion field. So far, this is exactly the same thing I talked about already. But the thing about the string though, is that it looks like the electromagnetic current is no longer conserved because when I take the divergence of the electromagnetic current acting on mu, divergence acting on F dual mu vanishes by Bianchi identity. So this piece identically vanishes, so that's okay. But when the derivative axon, sorry, the axion field instead, then you have a problem because when you have these two derivatives axion axion field, but axion, has this curl behavior around the string. So normally this would identically vanish, but because of this, uh, this uh, winding behavior of the axion field, there's a singularity at the origin. So this del mu del nu A actually has this delta function contribution. So there is actually a non-conservation of the electromagnetic current localized on string which is independent of the value of the decay constant because decay constant coming from discontinuity in A by two pi F pi cancels one of F pi in the, co co in, in the coefficient. So you get this contribution that there is a non-conservation of the electromagnetic current localized on string proportional to the electric field along this string. So that's the conclusion. And obviously, if the electromagnetic current is not conserved, then that means the U1 QED is anomalous. That leads to inconsistent quantum theory. So that clearly that's not the, the whole story. 
So the way you understand the, uh, uh, the, the consistency of the theory is that there has to be a massless chiral fermion on the string, which is also an anomalous gauge theory in one plus one dimension. And that anomaly would cancel this contribution we have seen from the axion. So this is actually very similar physics to the fractional quantum Hall effect because of the Chern-Simon term in the uh, quantum Hall systems. The gauge variation of Chern-Simon term gives you the boundary term, which gets precisely canceled by so-called the edge state, which is the massless electron running around the edge of the quantum Hall system. So this is the way the boundary contribution or one dimensional contribution on string ends up ca canceling the anomaly coming from this bulk term uh, due to the axion uh, configuration. And this is actually not too surprising because if you go back to the original UV description of this triplet quark Q, in the presence of the axion string where phi is a space-time dependent, space dependent configuration, you actually find a zero mode for this quark Q, and that's precisely the zero mode that appears as the massless fermion on the string that cancels the anomaly. But the point here is that this is a chiral fermion. Otherwise, it doesn't produce the anomaly to fully cancel the anomaly coming from the bulk. And this has been talked about mostly by rather formal people, but the consequence on phenomenology had not been talked about much in the literature. And what that means when you have this chiral massless fermion on the string, uh, which is given by, uh, uh, that gives you this non-divergence of the, uh, the electromagnetic current on the string, a uh, proportion of the electric field, is that you actually have a buildup of charge and current. So the reason that is, is that because the current is chiral, chiral current in one plus one dimension means that you have one minus gamma five, namely J naught charge density and J one, the current along this uh, string direction on the string are the same. So this divergence equation tells you that there's a time dependence of the uh, charge density and current proportional to the electric field applied to the system. And therefore charge and current densities actually grow as a function of time. So that's the buildup of charge and current. And this form of the buildup of the charge is exactly what you see in a superconductor, namely it's the London equation. And that's how you see that axion string is necessarily superconducting. And it doesn't build up forever though, because this quark field, which gives you this anomaly, has to actually decay into the standard model particles because we're talking about this high energy scale. So this quark field is presumably very heavy and it, it does annihilate into glue glue because it has color but it goes too heavy beyond the unitarity limit and therefore ends up overclosing the universe. So that's why it has to decay to the standard model. It turns out that the only consistent Petri Queen charge assignment to allow for the decay of this Q field into the standard model quarks is this discharge assignment because this Q field cannot be a SU2 doublet that will lead to exact Z2 discrete symmetry leading up the domain wall. This really has to be singlet except for the quark at the QCD. And for the singlet quark to decay into the standard model particles, it has to couple to the Higgs and the left-handed quark in this fashion. And therefore, you know that this has to be uh, Petri Queen neutral. And therefore, the only particle that has Petri Queen charge is the left-handed component of this heavy quark. But the point is that once you have this Yukawa coupling, then you can hit the string with, for example, Higgs or this quark and that would actually knock out this zero mode out of the string. And therefore this <coughs> buildup of charge is actually stopped by this dissipative effect due to the uh, plasma particles, either Higgs or right-handed quark, left-handed quark. Sorry, this is a typo. So it's, but this dissipation process stops below a certain temperature, which is like hundred GeV typically. So even though the, uh, the buildup is always stopped by this uh, thermal scattering effect for a long time, once you actually go below this temperature, it starts to build up again. And once you have a charge building up on the uh, string, it would affect its dynamics. And in one particular case we considered is the situation where universe has a uh, primordial magnetic field 
So as you may know, that intergalactic magnetic field as observed at the level of 10 microgauss, the origin of that is not understood. And so there is the class of theories where it is assumed that this magnetic field is primordial, coming from some kind of phase transitions in the early universe. So the magnetic field could well have pre uh, been present at the early universe when the strings are already still moving above the QCD temperature. And if you have this charge buildup on the string moving in a magnetic field, then of course it sees the electric field and that's how that charge starts to build up. And once the charge is built up, then that would actually lead to a, uh, a, a friction because the, uh, the, there is the uh, electromagnetic plasma in the universe at that moment. So because string is charged, that gets friction and gets slowed down in plasma. So this is how the current would build up as a function of time, builds up rather quickly. And once the current builds up, the string motion slows down to a non relativistic motion rather quickly. So string doesn't move freely, it moves rather slowly. So this idea of uh, keep simplifying the network doesn't happen very efficiently. So you end up with much denser network of cosmic strings at the end of the day, and that leads to much more axions in the end. So this is actually how much axions you might get uh, relative to what you need for the dark matter density. And for a decay constant in this range, which is relatively low, then you actually find a rather a large number of axions. So typically to get the dark matter density for the axion, you go to a very high decay constant like 10 to 12 GeV. For this range of uh, decay constant, you don't expect to see much of the axion abundance, but because of this enhancement due to the friction in the motion of strings, you get far more axions enhanced by something like five orders of magnitude or so. So decay constant then has to be below 10 to 7 GeV or so. So that is already in a tension with the astrophysical bounds and, and whether this actually uh, the limit stands does require more detailed numerical simulation, which is beyond our expertise. We scale existing simulation to work out this kind of uh, estimates of the limits. And, and I hope that somebody in the community would actually undergo a more detailed numerical simulation. So this is the parameter space where that is still allowed. So that's below one. Uh, for the dark matter density of the axion. So it has to require either very low decay constant or very low temperature for this magnetic field generation primordially. And so you have to be down in this range to be consistent. So that actually puts extra constraint on the models of the primordial magnetic field generation. So that's the end of my talk today. Axion string is necessarily superconducting and which is generic for any axion-like particle as long as it has this AF dual coupling. But specifically for the QCD axion case, it needs the minimal case BZ model. And looking in this particular model, the charge builds up on the axion due to primordial magnetic field. So that enhances the axion abundance. So we really need to do a detailed simulation to understand its real consequences. And as I said, not much phenomenology had been thought about about this nature of axion string being superconducting. So there could well be other consequences. And so that's actually an interesting subject to think about for many people in this audience today. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, very interesting talk. And I, I'm sure that there should be some questions from the audience. Okay, please go ahead. I have a question. So. Uh, for the case of uh, uh, superconducting axion, I mean, you mentioned that when this uh, heavy fermion couples to Higgs and light, quark, uh, heavy quark couples to Higgs and light mm -hmm. quark, mm -hmm. actually right. that just makes the uh, strings not move. But I just, uh, I'm curious, uh, that depends on the coupling, the Yugawa, and you can tune the Yugawa to be very small, allowing, I mean, the heavy quark to decay. And then how does uh, the physics that you are talking about depend on this uh, change of the coupling? So, so this is actually in thermal bass. So uh, it, as long as Y is not too small, this dissipation does happen, but eventually it does stop. So the smaller the coupling is, dissipation stops earlier. So you have more of the charge build up. So that's the consequence of a smaller power coupling. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Kindo.
maybe also is there any question in the sec uh, first part of the talk? Oh, uh, okay. I have one question. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, is there any uh, minimal value of private magnetic field that you need to get this uh, kind of enhancement of the uh, action dark matter from the strings? Yeah, so what we are using here is mm -hmm. the uh, sort of a minimum magnetic field you would need for the purpose of explaining the current intergalactic uh, uh, magnetic field. So we assume this B naught of 10 to minus 13, oh, 10 to minus 13 gauss. gauss. That's been, yeah, so, so that's to explain minimum this, size. So to explain which phenomena? Uh, to explain the existing, the present intergalactic magnetic field. So that, that conclusion is based on which, which kind of observations? I mean, the, 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 this, uh, I mean, this minimally required intergalactic magnetic field from yeah, which kind so, of? Yeah, so it's just the magnetic field uh, basically mm -hmm. behaves like a radiation. So the okay. magnetic field goes like one of a squared. So in okay. order to get the current size of the magnetic field, the magnetic field earlier on had to be larger. So by using this, the current magnetic field 10 to minus 13 gauss. No, no, no. My question is that the uh, oh. from which observation uh, you, I mean, we, we conclude that the, you know, the, at the current value of intergalactic magnetic field is given ah, by ah, that. Sorry, sorry. That's sorry, I'm sorry. Observation. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's from the blazer observation. A uh, blazer, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, you accept that the, okay, this blazer indeed indicates that the existence of uh, primordial magnetic, intergalactic magnetic. Okay, that's good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Okay, I have a question about the first part of your talk. Uh, you talked about uh, when the dark matter decays into actions, you, you still have a uh, extra galactic sources add up mm -hmm. to give you some spectrum, which is wider than uh, usual uh, cold dark matter. Right. So do, do you think the uh, you still have a monochromatic action spectrum uh, due to the dark matter decay, uh, and then the and yeah, then but previous even, search, even this mono, monochromatic peak is put, actually quite spread out from the point uh, of view of experiment uh -huh. because it's ten to minus three instead of ten to minus six. Uh -huh. I see. So in terms of scanning, uh -huh. the many runs have to be combined together to gain the sensitivity. That's why you have to look at the data with a different kind of analysis technique. Mm -hmm. So that had not been done so far. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm talking to Carl van Bieber and begging him to actually do the data analysis uh, from this point of view, uh, rather than the usual, uh, the dark matter uh, search, uh, axion search. Mm -hmm. And that is yet to be done. Okay. Yeah, so that is also interesting. Yeah. Okay, I think that we are running out of time. So I think that we have a pretty, uh, we should, I'm sure that there are more must be more uh, questions, but uh, uh, let's move on. Thank you, uh, Hitoshi, for your ni nice talk. Thank you. Okay. So let's move on to next two speaker, uh, who is the uh, Kyun Choi. Can you share your screen? Yeah.